In this session, we're going to talk about what the Garden of Eden was like. Why did they live to be 900 years old before the flood came? What was different about that original creation that we're not seeing today? And tell you how you can uh, see, uh, take God's promise that He's going to restore the earth like it used to be. You can be in on that if you'd like. If you go through the Bible and add up the dates, it's not that hard to do. You'll come to a date of about 6,000 BC, or 6,000 years ago, 4,000 BC for the creation. That's the dates you get from adding up the ones given in the Bible. So we're going to cover a couple things now. What was it like before the flood came? Is it possible for a person to live over 900 years? You could learn a lot in 900 years. Many people have never thought of this, but do you realize that Adam spoke every language in the world? Because there was only one, okay? Married to the prettiest girl in the world too, by the way. But uh, things were very different back then. <laughs> Textbooks in school are going to tell your kids dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. Is that true? Well, if the Earth's only 6,000 years old, that can't be true. Where do dinosaurs fit in? Well, we'll cover that in a minute. Did dinosaurs live millions of years ago, or have they always lived with humans? They just had a different name for them. They called them dragons. Hmm. What was the original creation like? What did they eat before the flood came? What's it going to be like in the 1,000-year reign of Christ when the Lord fixes things back like they used to be? Where did all the water for the flood come from, and where did it go? And were there really giant people on this earth over 10 feet tall? Well, hang on. We're going to try to cover as much of that as we can here, so let's go. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, Knowing this first, there shall come in the last days scoffers. Did you know there are people that scoff at the Bible? You know the reason people scoff at the Bible? It's not because of their science. They think it is, okay. But no, they scoff at the Bible because of their lust. They don't want God telling them what to do. That's the bottom line every single time. But look, it says, the heavens and the earth were made by His Word. You know, when God made the universe, He didn't lift one finger. He didn't turn one screw or pound one nail. He just spoke, and every molecule lined up. That's incredible to think about. When He speaks, the waves lay down, the wind quits blowing. When He speaks, the dead come to life. When He speaks, the universe is created. Everything obeys the voice of God, uh, except us. He's having some trouble out of us right now, but He's going to fix that one of these days, when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father, coming soon to a city near you. Mm -hmm. But the scoffers are willingly ignorant of how God made the heavens by His Word, and they're ignorant of how the earth was standing out of the water and in the water. Genesis chapter 1 says, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Well, what is a firmament? Some people say it must be the dirt, you know, because the dirt keeps the water away from the water. No, it's not the dirt. Read down to verse number 20, and it says, The fowls, that's the birds, fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. The birds fly in the firmament. The birds do not fly in the dirt. Okay, the birds fly in the air. So the first heaven is telling us right here is where the birds fly. Verse 7 says, God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. Now, wait a minute. Is he telling us there was water above where the birds fly? Psalm 148 says, Praise him, ye waters that be above the heavens. So first, uh, second Peter tells us, the earth was standing out of the water and in the water. Apparently, when God first made the earth, there was a canopy of water or ice above the atmosphere. It's not there now. It all fell down at the time of the flood. But Isaiah tells us, the Lord sits on the circle of the earth. <laughs> Interesting. 3,000 years ago, the Bible said the earth is round. Christians have never taught the earth is flat. Some heathens have believed that and tried to blame it on the Christians, but we've always known the earth is round. But then it says, He stretched out the heavens. Seventeen times in the Bible it says He stretches out the heavens. Maybe that's why we have a red shift in astronomy. And people say, how did the light get from the stars to here? Oh, you got it all backwards. The Bible says God made the earth first and then the stars. So the question is, how did the stars get from here to there? Not how did the light get from there to here? Cover more on that on video 7. But he stretched out the heavens. Interesting. Today's atmosphere that we're breathing has six layers. Troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, exosphere, and ionosphere. There used to be a seventh layer. It was a layer of water or ice above the atmosphere. 
I don't know what it was because it's gone now. Okay, all we can do is make a theory about it. This is called the canopy theory, which says there was a layer of water or ice, probably ice, above the atmosphere. I happen to believe it's probably 10 or 20 inches of ice, super cold ice, suspended by the magnetic field. This ice or water would block out UV light, some of it. It would increase air pressure. Today, the air is about 100 miles thick. It would squeeze it all down probably to 10 or 20 miles and double the air pressure on the surface. Article about that here. Josephus wrote in his book that the Hebrews believed when God made the earth on the second day, he placed a crystalline firmament around it. A crystalline firmament. Probably super cold ice, okay? There was not only a canopy of water above the earth, there was water in the crust of the earth. Psalm 24 says, The earth is the Lord's. He founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. See, most of the water that's now in the oceans used to be in the crust of the earth. Psalm 136 says, He stretched out the earth above the waters. It's not the way it is today. I believe the original creation had a layer of water above, maybe 10 or 20 inches, who knows, of ice probably, and then a layer of air to breathe, probably 10 or 20 miles, I don't know. And then dirt and rocks to stand on, the crust of the earth, which we still have. But inside the crust of the earth, there was water. That's the water that came shooting to the surface when the fountains of the deep broke open. I think the earth today still has cracks where it broke open at the time of the flood. I taught earth science for years. The earth is broken up into plates. There's no question. I've been to the San Andreas Fault, the Hayward Fault, the New Madrid Fault, the Golden Fault. None of them are my fault, but I've been there, okay? There's no question there are cracks in the earth's crust, and when they move around, buildings fall down. There's no question the earth is broken up, and there's no question the plates are still moving. The question is, when did all this happen? Now, the evolutionist will tell you this happened over millions and millions of years. The creationist says, no, all this catastrophe probably started at the time of that flood when the fountains of the deep broke open. That's what caused the fault lines. And the water went shooting to the surface, and it's still here today. This canopy of water that used to be there in the original creation would make the whole earth like a big greenhouse. And they've got a new theory now that says maybe a lack of oxygen killed the dinosaurs. A lack of oxygen? Why would they say that? Well, they had a big symposium in 1993. A bunch of scientists got together to study the apatosaurus. And they said, folks, we've got a problem. An 80-foot apatosaurus had nostrils the same size as a horse. How is an 80-foot animal going to get enough air through nostrils the same size as a horse? He'd be sucking so hard trying to get a breath, it'd set him on fire from the friction from the wind whistling in there. <clears throat> they couldn't breathe. Well, apparently they did breathe because bones of dinosaurs are found all over the planet. Even in Antarctica and Alaska. I mean, dinosaurs lived everywhere, okay? So how could an 80-foot animal get enough air? Well, today he probably couldn't not to get 80 feet long, but I think before the flood came, they had this canopy of air or of water or ice that would increase air pressure. Plus, they had richer oxygen. You know, when they drill into the amber, how many saw the movie Jurassic Park, you know, where they drilled in to get the mosquito blood out? Sometimes in amber, which is petrified tree sap, they find air bubbles in the amber. When they analyze the air bubbles, they find out they're 50% more oxygen than we have today. Today, we're breathing 21% oxygen, Amber bubbles have 32% oxygen. Did you know if you lived in a world with double the air pressure and 50% more oxygen, just breathing would be exciting? Adam would go, Phew. Wow. That was fun. <laughs> hey, Eve, let's do that again. Ready? Go. Phew. The earth had more oxygen in the past than it does now. Now, you kids are going to be told in textbooks that the earth had no oxygen at the beginning when life was evolving, called a reducing atmosphere. That is baloney. We cover all that about uh, video four, about how life began. <laughs> Could not have evolved with oxygen or without oxygen. But if you double the air pressure and increase oxygen, not only does your hemoglobin take on oxygen like it's supposed to, <clears throat> your plasma will get oxygen saturated, which means you could run hundreds of miles without getting tired. Adam and Eve didn't need a car. They could run to grandma's. I think before the flood came, <coughs> I think things were a whole lot different. With increased oxygen, you would heal up much faster. In the pre-flood world, if they had to double the air pressure and increased oxygen, you would just be full of energy all the time. There's a guy in Japan started raising tomato plants with pressurized carbon dioxide. You know, plants breathe CO2, not oxygen. 
His tomato plant grew faster than normal. When it was two years old, it was nine, uh, 14, 16 feet tall and produced 900 tomatoes. They moved it to a shopping center and built scaffolding to hold the branches up. They said, you know, this thing might produce 10,000 tomatoes. This is uh, one tomato plant. It ended up growing 40 feet tall and producing 15,000 tomatoes off of one plant. This layer of water above the earth would act as a barrier that would block out UV light and x-rays and other harmful things that come from the sun. See, the sun produces a lot of stuff besides light. It produces x-rays and gamma rays and beta rays and all them ray boys come down here and they're pretty hard on your carcass. X-rays particularly are dangerous. How many have ever had an x-ray before? I broke nine bones growing up. My brother broke 21. <laughs> we played rough in our neighborhood. But a lot of people don't realize the sun x-rays us every day. We're being x-rayed right now. Now concrete will stop x-rays and water will stop x-rays, but this roof on this church will not stop x-rays. They're coming right through the roof and right through your body. And you're being x-rayed as you sit there. But your skin feels the full force of these x-rays. And your body has to fix the damage. I mean, you fix millions of holes in your skin every single day. Millions of them. And after 50 or 60 years, or 70 or 80 for sure, everybody around you starts to notice you are losing the battle for damage control. Your skin begins to wrinkle up. You say, Brother Hovind, I, I, I don't want to get old and wrinkled. Okay. If you don't want to get wrinkled, there are three things you can do about it. Number one, you can die early. <laughs> Number two, you can carry a lead or a concrete umbrella over your head at all times. Do not ever get exposed to the x-rays. You say, well, Brother Hovind, I don't want to get old and wrinkled. Oh, I'm sorry. If you get old, you're going to get wrinkled, okay? You might as well get ready for it. But that didn't happen before the flood. The Bible says before the flood came, they lived to be over 900 years old and probably didn't wrinkle. One guy is going around, he claims he's a creationist. He says, now folks, uh, they didn't really live to be 900. They counted every month as a year. They used a lunar calendar, and you have to divide those numbers by 12. Wow, that's an even bigger miracle. Enoch was 65 when he begat Methuselah. Two of these guys are 65. Let's see, divided by 12. That makes him five and a half when he became a daddy. <laughs> I doubt that real seriously, okay. I'd have a hard time believing that. No, they really were living to be 900, and they got bigger. Here's a skeleton of a man, 11 foot 6 inches tall. Well, long, not tall. He's laying down now. 11 6. How'd you like to have one of those guys on your basketball team? Roman Emperor Maximus was 8 foot 6 2,000 years ago, where we get our word maximum from. A 9 foot 8 inch skeleton was found in Indiana. Two skeletons, 9 feet tall, found in Virginia City. Every skeleton found in this mine, in, uh, I mean, in this burial mound in Louisiana, 20 skeletons were found, all of them 9 feet tall. Skeleton 10 feet tall, found in Humboldt Lake, Nevada. And in Guam, they have a legend that the giants used to live on the island of Guam and built these big latte stones over there. In Indiana, eight giants were found, ranging from 8 to 9 feet long, wearing heavy copper armor. The museum was not interested in them. Why would a museum not be interested in nine-foot skeletons to put on display? Could it be that there's a theory called evolution which says we started off small and we're getting bigger? Which makes us feel important, of course, you know. We're evolving. Ye shall be as gods. You're getting better. Could it be the truth is exactly the opposite? People were much bigger before the flood and now we're getting worse? And maybe they're trying to hide that? A 12-foot skeleton found in Lompoc Rancho, California, Another 12-footer found in Tucson, Arizona. This is a giant block of rock. Who on earth is moving these things? Consider that's a camel in front of it for scale. Who's cutting and moving these things? This is a 39-pound axe head. Swing a 10-pound sledge for a few minutes and see why I'm wondering who's swinging a 39-pound axe head. This is a stone designed to be held between the thumb and finger for chipping. This skull used to be on display in Winnemucca, Nevada until a few years ago when they took it down. It's in the basement. You have to specially ask to see it. A giant human skull. Here's a normal human thumb bone. Underneath is a giant human thumb bone. We've got a replica of a thigh bone in our museum from a guy that would have been about 13 feet tall. If you meet a guy like that, call him Sir. 
There's an article on the table all about it down here if you want to read more on this one. These jawbones are on display at a hotel in Turkey, six and a half inches across the TMJs. Any one of you could put your head inside the jaw and bounce it around. Waukesha, Wisconsin. They found a human skull three times the size of ordinary humans, found in an Indian burial mound. Giants were on the earth in those days. That's what the Bible says. There were giants here. Well, the Bible says we're made in God's image. Now, if we're made in God's image, why do we pay to teach the kids that this is Grandpa? What is the truth about the cavemen? Where do cavemen fit into this picture anyway? I mean, if the Bible's true and the earth's only 6,000 years old, what about the cavemen? Evolution teaches we're getting better and someday we're going to become God. The facts are, we're getting worse. Things are falling apart. We now have an incredible genetic load. We are mentally and physically deficient compared to Adam and Eve. Things are not getting better. But we all teach the kids in the textbooks, this is Grandpa. What's the truth about the cavemen? Is it possible for an ape-like creature to turn to a human? Was your ancestor an ape-like creature? I don't think so. Let's talk about a few of the so-called cavemen. We could spend hours on this topic, but we got more to cover here. Uh, Nebraska man was used for years as evidence for evolution. All they found for a Nebraska man was one tooth. That is the entire Nebraska man right there. One tooth. Then they built an entire man from that one tooth and later made him a wife. Now you have to really be good to know what his wife looks like from his tooth. Okay, but these are professionals. Don't question them, okay? They know what they're talking about. Later they found out the tooth actually came from a pig. There's the real Nebraska man right there. How about Piltdown Man, named after the gravel pit it was found in in Piltdown, England. Somebody took a human skull and an ape's jaw, they filed them down and fooled everybody. In 1912, they discovered the Piltdown Man. It was in the New York Times. Darwin theory proved true from the Piltdown Man. Piltdown Man was a hoax. Somebody had taken an ape's jawbone and a human skull, broke the uh, TMJs off, made them fit together, and fooled everybody, filed the teeth down. For 40 years, it was in the textbooks as proof for evolution. It was a fraud, exposed as a fraud, 1953. Neanderthal man is still in your textbooks, used in your town here in Knoxville, Tennessee. But it's been proven years ago, it cannot possibly be a missing link. Well, back in 1856, they found a skeleton petrified, a man petrified, in this valley called the Neander Valley, and they named it Neanderthal man. The back was bent over. Well, apes walk on four legs and man walks on two, so when the Darwin's theory became popular, they resurrected the Neanderthal man and said, oh wow, maybe he's slowly evolved and he's coming up. Well, they've known from the very beginning it was an old man with arthritis who's slowly going down. He's not coming up at all. <laughs> he's headed down. But they still keep him in the textbooks. About 300 Neanderthals have been found. Their brains are bigger than ours. Their bone structure was incredibly strong. They said they had so many muscles that the average Neanderthal could probably pick up the average NFL linebacker and fling him over the goalpost. Phenomenal strength in the Neanderthals. Jack Cuazzo, a friend of mine from New Jersey, has been a dentist for 32 years. He came and spoke at our conference a few weeks ago at the boot camp we had <clears throat> in Pensacola. He studied the actual Neanderthal skulls in Europe. He said these Neanderthals are just perfectly normal humans that are living to really great age. See, before the flood came, the people lived to be 900. After the flood, lifespans dropped off to 400, and then 200, and then 100. But that's still a long time to live. And it's a simple fact, the bones of your eyebrow ridge never stop growing. So if you could live to be three or 400 years old, your eyebrow ridge would stick way out. People today, they use their jaws a lot, like the Aborigines in Australia are always using their jaws as a vice. They don't carry a toolbox with them. Their eyebrow ridge sticks out really far because of the chewing muscles. It pulls on the bone. The Neanderthals are perfectly normal human that are living to be two or three hundred years old. That's all they are. Their brain's bigger than ours. They're not subhuman at all. They're just really old human. There's an aborigine on the far left over there. See the eyebrow ridge sticking out? That's from chewing or using your jaw muscles a lot. What they've got in there now is called Australopithecus afarensis. That was proven wrong in 18, I mean in 1973. 30 years ago, proven wrong. Why are they keeping that in the textbooks as evidence for evolution? 
They've got Australopithecus africanus, or afarensis, better known as Lucy. How many have ever heard of Lucy before? Donald Johansson found Lucy in 1974, Ethiopia. He had gone there with a grant to look for missing links. Somebody gave him some money, said, here, go find a missing link. If you don't find one, no more money. Two weeks before his grant money expired, he discovered Lucy. Highly motivated, I suspect. And that would be a suspect, by the way, in a court of law, you know. Lucy was three feet tall. It was obviously a chimpanzee of some kind. Now, the bones of the skull were crushed thoroughly. Could not tell anything about the skull. But when they put it together for your kid's textbook, they can make it half human, half ape. The knee joint that was labeled Lucy's knee in National Pornographic, uh, Geographic was actually found a mile and a half away and 200 feet deeper. But National Geographic labeled it Lucy's knee. It's not Lucy's knee. St. Louis Zoo put human feet on their Lucy display. Not one foot bone or hand bone was found. Not one. Every other australopithecine that's been found has curled toes. Professor Menton at Washington University said, the statue is a complete misrepresentation. That's a big fancy word for lie. I prefer, I prefer smaller words. It's a lie. The zoo director said, zoo officials have no plans to knuckle under. We cannot be updating every exhibit based on every new piece of evidence. We look at the overall exhibit and the impression it creates. And we think this impression it creates is correct. Uh, Bruce, are you telling me you would lie to kids coming through your zoo just to get an impression across to them that evolution is true? You mean your theory is more important than the facts? That's exactly correct. They will lie to the kids going through these science centers and zoos to make them believe this evolution theory. And there are lies in the textbooks, like 60 of them. We cover that on video number four, lies in the textbooks. There's a good book on the so-called cavemen, if you want to read this, if you're being taught this in school, get the book by Marvin Lubinow, Bones of Contention. Excellent book. It'll really put everything into perspective for you. This textbook says, he's the daddy of us all. Oh, that's silly. You don't know he's the daddy of anybody. You find bones in the dirt, you don't know it's the daddy of anybody. It's just the mother of all mammals from the Smithsonian. If you find bones, you don't know it's the mother of anything. See, if you find fossil in the dirt, all you know is it died. You couldn't prove it had any kids, and you sure couldn't prove it had different kids. And why would you think a bone you found in the dirt can do something animals today cannot do, which is produce something other than their kind? But not only were people living longer before the flood, animals were too, and they were growing bigger, probably much bigger. Here's a hornless rhinoceros, 18 feet tall. That's a big rhino. People say, that's a prehistoric animal. No, did you know the word prehistoric was not even in the dictionary until about 100 years ago? We got a dictionary from 1860. The word prehistoric is not there. No such thing as prehistoric back in 1860. Here's a dictionary from 1892. The word prehistoric is still not there. See, there are things that are pre-flood, but there's no such thing as prehistoric. We have history from the first day. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. You can't go before that. So there's no such thing as prehistoric. But before the flood came, this canopy of water would increase air pressure, which would make things behave very differently. It makes insects grow much bigger. Like this dragonfly with a 50-inch wingspan. Cockroaches get pretty good size today. But did you know giant cockroaches have been found? 18-inch long cockroach fossils. Giant fossil centipede, eight and a half feet long, was found. Grasshoppers two feet long have been found fossilized. You can make a meal out of those. Tarantula with a three-foot leg span fossil. 60-foot cattail fossils have been found. A donkey nine feet high. From Texas, of course. Everything's bigger in Texas. Okay. Giant sloths obviously lived on the planet. Now you're going to be told that was millions of years ago. No, it wasn't. It was just before the flood came. Buffalo were found with horn spans up to 12 feet elk with 12-foot antlers. Some of you deer hunters are thinking, wow, that will look good on the wall. Fossil kangaroos have been found 10 feet tall. And fossil wombat, the size of a mini. Here's a fossil of a guinea pig that was 1,500 pounds. That's a big guinea pig. Birds have been found 13 feet tall. Increasing air pressure means more gas gets into the water, and fish have to breathe in the water through their gills. So if you had more gas dissolved in the water from greater air pressure, now the fish can get bigger. And you can get a lot more fish per cubic mile. 
Today, if a shark has a tooth about an inch long, it indicates the shark was probably about 15 feet long. Did you know fossil sharks' teeth are found indicating sharks used to get 80 feet long on this planet? Can you imagine an 80-foot shark? The movie Jaws had a 25-foot shark. You'd have to use jaws for bait to catch one of these megalodons. Turtles got pretty good size. That's a big turtle uh, on the left. Oysters were found two miles above sea level. 11-foot oysters weighing 600 pounds, two miles above sea level in the Andes Mountains. When they climbed Mount Everest, they found petrified clams on top of Mount Everest. Interesting thing about these clams, they're petrified and they're closed. Now, I'd like to point out, Mount Everest is a little ways from the beach, first of all, okay? About 450 miles to the beach. And clams do not climb mountains very well. And when a clam dies, it opens. You can walk along the beach and find a million seashells. You hardly ever find a matched pair. And you never find them closed if they're dead. They open right away. How do you get petrified closed clams on top of Mount Everest? Uh, I think there was a flood. Reptiles never stop growing. It's a simple fact. Most reptiles never stop growing. They grow all their life. People stop growing. When you're 16 or 18, you're going to quit growing. At least vertically. Some go horizontally thereafter. But reptiles never stop growing. What would happen to a reptile if you put him in the Garden of Eden and let him live to be 900 years old? You'd have a big lizard. A really big lizard. Dinosaurs were big lizards that lived with Adam and Eve before the flood came. You can get these Jackson chameleons right now at the pet store. What's he going to look like at about 15 tons? Probably some kind of triceratops. Dinosaur means terrible lizard. And dinosaurs lived with humans all through history. They just had a different name for them. We'll cover more on dinosaurs on video number three. But dinosaur bones and human bones have been found together. Dinosaur bones were found in the same rock strata as these fossilized human hands. You kids will be taught in school that the geologic column represents the history of the earth and that the Carboniferous era is when coal formed. <laughs> That's baloney. Coal formed at the time of the flood because that world was buried. Okay? They found a gold chain inside a lump of coal back in 1881 in Illinois. This iron pot found inside a lump of coal. This thing found inside solid rock, supposed to be 600 million years old. You know, the first change after the flood, animals became afraid of man. They weren't afraid before. Now they became afraid of man. Second change after the flood, God said, Noah, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Now you can eat meat. And because of that, there's a lot of suffering in the world. Animals suffer so we can eat, and it's perfectly fine to eat meat. But God made a perfect world, and man destroyed it. Man brought death and sin into this world. Paul said, for I reckon, that proves he's a southerner, that the sufferings of this present time, is there suffering in the world today? Lots of it. The whole world's filled with groaning and travailing and pain. Charlie Darwin said, I'm bewildered. I had no intention to write atheistically. But there seems to be so much misery in the world. Charlie couldn't understand why God made a world with suffering. Charlie, God didn't make a world with suffering. But Charlie Darwin thought, from the war of famine and nature and death, famine, and na war of nature was from famine and death, the most exalted object we're capable of conceiving. Wait a minute. Charlie, are you saying that war and famine and death is what exalts us to a higher level? That's exactly what he says, and that's exactly what evolution teaches today. Nothing's changed. Death is the hero of the plot for the evolutionist. The Bible says God made a perfect world. Man wrecked it. By one man, sin came into the world, and death by sin. It was Adam's fault. You can't blame a wrecked car on the manufacturer. Send a picture to the manufacturer of a wreck and say, hey, why did you build a car like this? <laughs> it didn't look like this when it left the factory. Today, folks, we are living in a junkyard. Now, I like living on planet Earth, and Knoxville's a beautiful place, but I'm telling you, folks, this is nothing compared to what Adam and Eve saw. This is a junkyard. But God's going to fix it back. Someday the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid and the calf and the young lion and a fatling together, 
and a little child shall lead them. Now, there's not a whole lot, not, not enough scripture to be real dogmatic, but it appears that there's going to be a thousand year span coming after the end of this age when if you're saved, you're going to get to live here for a thousand years with everything fixed back, Garden of Eden conditions. Kids, you're going to get to have your own pet dinosaurs. That's going to be cool. Then he's going to make new heavens and a new earth. Isaiah 65, 2 Peter 3, new heavens, new earth, Revelation 21, new heaven, new earth. You can't even imagine what that's going to be like. I sure can't. The Bible says, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. God has things planned for his kids that you can't even think about.